So for today's colloquium, we're really happy to have Susanna Bentagna. Susanna is a graduate student in Amsterdam. Uh, she's being advised by Alejandra Castro, and she's, she's now shared between Amsterdam and Cambridge for her time. Cambridge, the, the real Cambridge. Um, she also did her undergrad in Amsterdam in both uh, physics and math, and she works on holography in general and most, yeah, most importantly on the CFD side of things, but I'm sure she'll tell us all about that. Um, so, yeah. Please. Awesome. Thanks uh, so much for a nice introduction and uh, for the invitation to speak here. Uh, it's been great uh, visiting Boston and uh, seeing seeing all of you here. So today um, I want to talk about some work that uh, I've been uh, working on for uh, maybe the past year, um, which is about holographic inference on asymptotic expansions, and I hope that by the end of the talk, you will understand these words and uh, also uh, appreciate a little bit um, why these things might be important and interesting uh, for the study of black holes. Uh, so this work is uh, done uh, in collaboration with Luis Apollo, who's in uh, Xinhua, Alejandro Castro, my advisor in Cambridge, and uh, Diego Lesca, who is also in Amsterdam. All right. So it's long been known that uh, black hole physics bears a very striking resemblance uh, to thermodynamics. Um, some things that make that connection kind of clear is that black holes uh, emit Hawking radiation uh, and we can associate a temperature with them, the Hawking temperature. There's an entropy associated to black holes, uh, which is proportional to the area of the horizon, uh, the Bekenstein-Hawking uh, entropy, which will be uh, one of the main things that I'm talking about today. And also black holes satisfy uh, some kind of first law, uh, where the change in the mass is related to change in entropy and change in uh, currents. Very good. Um, but this raises a big question uh, with regards to uh, the uh, statistical interpretation of this entropy. In particular, the, uh, in statistical mechanics, the entropy is given by uh, the log of the number of microstates um, of the microstate with uh, certain charges. And so for black holes, the number of microstates uh, should be equal to the exponential uh, of the area divided by 40. This is uh, a huge number. Um, but then on the other hand, black holes can be characterized uh, completely by their charges. So then uh, one very important question is where do all these microstates come from? How can we uh, interpret them? And back in 1995, Strominger and Waffa uh, were able to derive uh, this area uh, behavior by counting supersymmetric microstates and string theory. And today we will uh, uh, see how to derive perturbative corrections uh, to the area law uh, by counting supersymmetric states in conformal field theories. And in the process, we will understand why these corrections are controlled by just a, a small uh, number of parameters uh, coming from the perturbative uh, spectrum in supergravity. And these results are possible due to uh, the mathematical control that we have in these supersymmetric uh, two-dimensional conformal field theories. Uh, but more on that after. Um, so these uh, two-dimensional superconformal field theories uh, that we'll discuss occur in black hole configurations uh, that have a near horizon geometry of ADS-3. And when that is the case, we can use the tools of the ADS-CFD correspondence uh, to relate them uh, to these uh, CFD quantities. And uh, one famous example is that there are 5D black holes that appear in type two string theory uh, compactified on a Kähler three manifold uh, times a sphere. And uh, these black holes, uh, they have a near horizon geometry of ADS3 process to it. These are precisely the black holes that uh, Strominger and Vapa studied 
And they also used, uh, um, even though ADS-CFT was not really a thing back then, they used the tools that, uh, that we use now. Is there a reason why we're picking K3 and not T4 here? Um, this is, the, for now, this is just an example, but later on, uh, T4 will not uh, appear uh, in the talk, basically uh, because um, the quantity that, uh, that they used to, to derive the area was the elliptic genus. Yeah. So this is the supersymmetric index and that one vanishes for T4. So you don't- Yeah, you can insert some, right, yeah. Naively, it vanishes, yes. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay, stick sorry. To I think so. Um. Um. So, uh, ADS three and uh, conformal field theories uh are important for black holes, um. But they also, in itself, are uh, a theory of uh, three dimensional gravity with negative cosmological constant, and these theories uh contain black holes of which we can understand uh the statistical interpretation. Uh, of corrections to the area law uh, using ADS CFT. So we're uh, studying gravity in three dimensions. And uh, the central object uh, that is uh, used to study quantum gravity is the quantum, uh, the gravitational path integral, which is given by uh, this quantity. It's an integral over, over metrics uh, and matter fields um, weighted by uh, e to the s, where s is the, some gravitational action uh, that depends on the metric and the matter fields. Um, but in many instances, the rules uh, of computing uh, this path integral are very unclear. It's very unclear what kind of metrics we should allow. Um, and even if we knew, if we know uh, what kind of metrics to allow, it's very hard uh, to compute. However, in theories with a negative cosmological constant, uh, the ones that we will uh, use today, we understand things uh, a lot better thanks to ADS-CFT. And the statement of ADS-CFT is that the gravitational path integral on a, a theory with a negative cosmological constant that we denote with ADS. Are you the push you get on before in the wall? presentation fall into a black <laughs> All right, we're back. Um, so the gravitational path integral in such a universe, um, the statement is that that thing is equal to the partition function of a, a CFT that lives at the asymptotic boundary of this, uh, of this universe. And so the gravitational path integral is uh, exactly equal to the CFT partition function. And therefore, the rules of quantum gravity are clear. Observables in quantum gravity uh, can be computed using uh, dual observables in the conformal field theory. And so they must satisfy the rules of, uh, of CFT. They uh, must be unitary, uh, local, and crossing symmetric. And in particular, very important for today, in ADS-3 CFT2, uh, you also have modular invariant, which is the um, main principle underlying uh, the techniques that I will talk about. Are, are you defining the left-hand side to be what you obtain z graph? like that's your definition? Yes. So, I mean, isn't it possible that the left-hand side, you have to include other stuff that's not given by just the integral over metrics? Or, uh, I guess I'm yeah, saying that-, that matter. It, Whatever. No, but I, I guess on the right hand side, we maybe have an exact description of ZCFT, right? But, right. Uh, you know, certain certain properties like ZCFT might not be manifest in any yes. version yes. of computing the sure. path integral on the left hand side. So, yes. so uh, I would say that the left hand side would be some approximate thing. And it might be that the, the just the gravity approximation won't satisfy the the CFT properties you want. You're okay. Yes, I, this is this I don't is want to put words but some people would say that maybe the left hand side, at least in some theories, is completely well defined. Or maybe we could ask well, for what theory yes. the left hand side is well defined. And right. Yes, no, I agree. And this is uh this is an important uh thing to keep in mind. Um I have a slide like this as well. I'm 
on us this way. So <laughs> very good. Um, all right. And uh, one important Sorry, can I ask a question? Can you guys hear me? The, of the duality is that it relates strong coupling to weak coupling and vice versa. So what that means is that whenever, basically what it means is that whenever uh, we can do a computation on one side of the duality, uh, because we're in weak coupling and we can use perturbative techniques, then the computation on the other side is very hard and we have basically no idea how to do it. Um, and I'm um, getting a question on the Zoom. I can... All right. Um, Nairad, do you want to try go ahead and... Uh, yeah, can you can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't disagree with maybe this is what was discussed earlier, but I wouldn't disagree with the equivalence of partition functions, but I would strongly disagree with the statement that the gravitational path integral is the same as the partition function of quantum gravity. Uh, and in fact, I think most of the recent developments uh, on the black information paradox in ads cft have illustrated that they're not the same. So. Can you explain, I guess, why you would think that you can get constraints on the path integral, given that it manifestly isn't computing the partition function, since the partition function, you know, should should factorize and the path integral doesn't? Um. Right. Sure. I guess. I guess what I'm, what I think, is how we should think about things, is that um. Um, when uh, these uh. These results about um, things not factorizing uh, in uh, the gravitational theory. The way that I think about it is that um, the the high energy uh, corrections to that, like these half wormholes, uh, show up in the in the path integral in, in ways that at least I don't fully understand. Um, but those uh, at the end of the day should should fix uh, the non factorization. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess I, 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 it's not obvious that, that, that they do, um, just because it looks like the path integral might be computing some self-average quantities very well, but not computing anything precise particularly well. But maybe you mean just in the saddle point approximation, and if you don't use the saddle point, somehow it should be fine? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't think that's the case, because um, at least with JT gravity, if you do a path integral um, and you compute the, uh, the free energy using the, path, the full non-perturbative path integral, uh, you still, there's multiple different ways of doing it. And if you just do the naive calculation, you get answers that don't uh, make sense in thermodynamics. So I think there's something else going on here, but um, maybe it doesn't matter for the constraints that you're putting on it. Right, yeah, I think that's true. Uh, both of your statements uh, make a lot of sense. Something with supersymmetric boundary conditions or? Sorry? Are you gonna be computing something with supersymmetric boundary conditions? Then some yes. of these non-factorizing quantities won't. And then contributing. So, then, yeah, right. yeah. In that case, maybe everything works out. Yeah. All right. Very good. So, with these caveats, um, where was I? Um, so, right. Uh, this duality uh, relates strong coupling to weak coupling. On the one hand, that is very nice because if you want to compute some quantity, you can pick. The description in which the computation is easy. Um, but then on the other hand, when you want to uh, match results between one side and the other, uh, it's a bit hard because uh, there will always be one side where the computations are uh, very complicated. Um, and we will see uh, that uh, one nice, uh, or what I think is a nice and surprising uh, instance of that uh, later. And so uh, the perspective we take is that the conformal field theory defines for us what we mean with a uh, gravitational theory. Um, so for any CFT, the, its partition function computes uh, a gravitational path integral. Uh, and generically, this leads to theories of gravity that do not have a low energy effective description of semi-classical general relativity and instead, uh, quantum effects are, are very big, uh, and uh, the gravitational theory will be uh, very non-local. Um, but we want to restrict ourselves to holographic CFDs uh, that do have such a nice uh, description in their dual theory. Um, 
And we will see that for these uh, nice holographic CFTs, we have a lot of mathematical control over corrections uh, to the black hole entropy. And we can understand uh, the origin of these uh, corrections uh, in the CFT. So that was the introduction. Uh, let me briefly outline uh, the rest of the talk. Uh, I'll start by saying some words uh, about these holographic CFTs. Um, and then we will switch gears a little bit and uh, discuss uh, these uh, mathematical functions called weak Jacobi forms and crossing kernels. And we will discuss their asymptotic expansions. And that part of the talk is basically uh, just math. Uh, I'll explain the purely mathematical result that underlies uh, these nice results uh, about black holes. And um, yeah, really over the last year, I've come to appreciate uh, all the math and number theory that is involved. And um, it's kind of nice to see how, how black holes are described by these uh, number theoretic uh, functions. And uh, I'll end with uh, applications uh, to physics. So holographic CFTs, we are looking uh, for these CFTs that whose dual description has an effective field theory description of uh, gravity, uh, classical, semi-classical gravity plus matter. And in other words, we want to understand what additional constraints to put on a CFT to ensure that its gravitational dual um, has these nice properties. There are Locally, there are uh, roughly four conditions that are uh, necessary for such a uh, for such to have such a nice description. Um, and I will just mention them very briefly, but uh, three of the four are not going to be too important uh, for this talk. Um, so, first of all, the central charge of the CFT uh, should be very large, and the reason that that is is that there is nice relation due to Brown and Hanau that relates the central charge to the uh, Newton's constant in the uh, gravitational theory. Um, and so that gives, uh, that sets the Planck scale and the scale of uh, quantum effects. And to have a semi-classical description, quantum effects should be small. Uh, so G Newton should be small. And the central charge should be big. Then secondly, there should be a set of operators uh, that behave as generalized free fields. And this ensures that uh, the gravitational theory um, is weakly coupled. So uh, higher curvature corrections are suppressed. Then thirdly, um, the light spectrum uh, should be very sparse. And I will uh, discuss this condition at length. So uh, let me not say too, too many words right now. And finally, there is this large gap condition that states that uh, the dimensions of uh, higher spin operators that are single trace should be very large. And in the dual theory, this sets a bound on the uh, non-locality of the gravitational theory. When the, the gap is large, um, the effective theory at low energies is local. So then uh, back to the sparse spectrum uh, condition. In order to ensure that the gravitational dual has a Hawking phase transition and that the CFT can reproduce the area law uh, of black hole entropy, the CFT should satisfy the so-called HKS bounds due to Hartman, Keller, and Stoika. And that says that the density of states that I denote here with rho of delta, where delta is roughly related to the energy or the mass inside the system, um, should scale in this way uh, when this parameter delta zero, which is related to the central charge or Newton's constant, um, is very big. So in the semi-classical regime, we should have uh, this type of scaling for these ranges of energies. Um, and having uh, this type of scaling implies that uh, the large energy behavior or the large uh, delta behavior uh, follows this, uh, this equation. And when you translate uh, that equation to the gravitational, uh, 
gravitational theory, this is precisely the uh, e to the area over 4G. Uh, so this reproduces exactly the Bekenstein-Hawking uh, entropy. And that formula should hold for all the states that uh, we associate to uh, black holes. And that's what, uh, what this final uh, line means. And uh, in, the, in the community, this is called an extended Carnegie regime. Uh, and this growth e to the four pi square root delta zero times delta is called uh, Cardi growth. What's extended about this? What is extended? Right. Um, any any CFT has Cardi behavior, but it has it for delta way larger than delta zero, and the HKS bound ensures that the the area extends all the way to the phase transition, right. or that there is a phase transition and that above the phase transition, you have uh, this behavior. Um, however, uh, we can have this growth that it that is compatible with the HKS bound. Um, but that type of growth is usually associated with the string uh, spectrum on ADS3. And so we want to make even a we want to make um, a separation uh, between rows that satisfy the HKS bound, um, but can be associated to the string-like uh, behavior, uh, which we call fast growth, uh, where you have this additional parameter gamma that could show up in the exponent. And so these rows um, are associated with uh, large non-local uh, effects in the gravitational dual um, and then the growth that uh, we uh, we are looking for, or that that is uh, consistent with having uh, a local effective description at low energies, is, is what we call slow growth, and it's given uh, by these types of rows, where again we have an exponent, but now there's uh, an alpha here that is strictly less than one. And we also allow for some uh, polynomial uh, scaling in front uh, for some uh, parameters theta and omega. And we will see that precisely these parameters theta, omega, and alpha uh, encode uh, corrections to the to the area well later on. <laughs> and this slow growth uh, behavior is, uh, like I said, it's compatible with having a, a local quantum field theory on, for example, this type of. Uh, this type of geometry. Right. Okay. So doesn't that isn't fast growth the one that matches like the traditional BZ story? If you're just mm -hmm. like if you're calculating the like if you're calculating cosmic microstates for like say the BZ black hole ADS three. I'm not oh BTZ. Oh sorry, BTZ, yeah, sorry. Uh so you mean the BTZ black hole in like pure gravity? Yeah. Yeah, the pure gravity has it's a trivially has a slow growth because uh, uh, these these uh, scales are precisely the um, up to the black hole uh, threshold. So for pure gravity, you only have one state below the black hole threshold, the vacuum, and nothing else. Um, so I guess trivially, you have this thing with alpha equals to zero and omega equals to zero. Yeah. So so. I, I guess I'd like to be to know what do you mean by the first one is stringy then? Um, so when you, um, I think when you compute uh, the partition function of string theory uh, on ADS3, you will get this. I think, okay. uh, due to all the stringy, stringy modes that show up and the towers of Kaluza Klein modes. More states than a quantum field theory. All right, very good. So in our in our list of uh, conditions, we should replace uh, the sparse spectrum condition with the uh, uh, condition of having a slow growing uh, partition function at uh, low energies. Um, and today we will study the imprints uh, of this, uh, the parameters of these uh, slow growing and fast growing forms. On the heavy part of the spectrum, so on the on the black hole part of the spectrum. This will give a microscopic understanding of corrections to the area term. 
And more precisely, we will study the elliptic genus of uh, sparse CFTs that have at least n equals two uh, supersymmetry. Um, and there are several reasons for that. Um, but the main one that I want to highlight today is that um, we have a lot of mathematical control over uh, this quantity. And so the elliptic genus is given by a trace over the Ramon Ramon sector of the CFT of this, uh, and it counts the Porter BPS states uh, in the theory. Uh, so the states that preserve some of the supersymmetry. Uh, and there's a, a minus one to the F that gives you a minus sign when you count fermions and a plus sign when you count bosons. And the way to, to read these variables is that uh, Q is uh, the conjugate or is related to tau in this way, where tau is the conjugate variable to, uh, to the mass. And Y is in the same way related to Z, which is the conjugate uh, variable to uh, the U1 charge. Uh, that you have when you have uh, this type of supersymmetry. And this uh, quantity, the elliptic genus, can be associated uh, to a weak Jacobi form, mm -hmm. um, which are mathematical functions that have uh, very strong uh, modular properties that we can use to find uh, their behavior at large uh, masses. So this is a weak Jacobi form for any 2D, 2 comma 2 theory? Yes, you can uh, you can relate uh, any elliptic genus. You have to do um, some rescaling of the U1 charges when you have fractional U1 charges. Oh, okay. So once you do that, uh, you have a, you obtain a weak Jacobi form. So the mathematical object that we consider are these weak Jacobi forms. They come with two parameters, um, the weight K and the index T. Um, these things are all not terribly important, but I wanted to uh, show them anyways to uh, have a complete story. Uh, so don't worry. Um, but this, uh, these forms are uh, basically functions from the upper half plane times the complex plane to the complex plane that have a Fourier uh, expansion of this type, uh, where n and l are integers. So for each um, energy n and charge l, roughly um, the c and l's, the coefficients, uh, encode how many of those states uh, in the form there are. And these coefficients uh, should uh, satisfy some uh, rules. They should be zero for all uh, negative n. And they have uh, very strict transformation properties uh, under modular transformations, which is shown here. Um, and the second transformation rule uh, has to do with spectral flow uh, symmetry. Um, but today we will use uh, this uh, first property heavily. And a very convenient quantity that we will use a lot is called the discriminant. Uh, it's uh, denoted by delta, which uh, already showed up a little bit before. And it's related to the charges and the index in this way. Um, and one thing that makes the discriminant nice is that it's uh, invariant under spectral flow. Um, and there are two properties that, um, that we use a lot. Um, so when you encode all these uh, transformation properties uh, that I uh, showed on the previous page, it follows that the free coefficients, so the CNL, only depend on this discriminant and in a very mild way on the charge. And we differentiate between two different classes of states depending on the sign of the discriminant. States with negative discriminant are called uh, polar states, and these are the, the light states of this of the theory. And states with positive discriminant are called uh, nonpolar, and these encode uh, the black holes, basically. And the discriminant is bounded from below by the index. The index is uh, related to the central charge of the CFT, and then again, through the Brandenau formula to the uh, 
to Newton's constant. So there's a, a finite number uh, of these polar states. And uh, a detail that's not so important uh, that I'll skip for now. Um, all right, and this delta zero is the is the minimal value of the discriminant. And it's uh, again related to the central charge. And the the leading and subleading behavior of these weak Jacobi forms uh, at large discriminants can be extracted using uh, this thing called crossing kernels. We will focus on weak Jacobi forms with weight zero, so that's so important right now. Um, and these crossing kernels, as far as I know, were first uh, used to study. Uh, the spectrum uh, by these authors, um, but they studied them for the full partition function. Um, and we study them for uh, this special quantity, the elliptic genus, where they will be even uh, stronger. And so we start by writing the weak Jacobi form, not as a free expansion, but as an integral over a distribution. Um, so here this exponent is uh, exactly the same as q to the n, y to the l that showed up before. But now we've replaced the CNLs uh, by a distribution that is a sum over delta functions that clicks uh, at every integer. And using the, um, the transformation properties of the Lee Jacobi form, we can uh, relate it, this exponent here to uh, exponent here in a, slightly different form, and here we just did uh, an estimate. And um, once we have done that, we will consider uh, the unique function that exists, I'll denote it with uh, P, that satisfies uh, this equation. These are all details that are um, not crucial to follow, but uh, they, uh, they show where uh, where the input of modular variance is. Um, and so when you combine uh, these equations, you find that this uh, distribution uh, over the density of states uh, is equal to a sum over all the uh, Fourier coefficients times this crossing curl. And this equation is called a crossing equation, and P is called the crossing kernel. And um, one very nice thing and crucial thing is that this crossing kernel uh, can be found analytically. And it's given uh, by this equation. Um, and the, the key thing about the crossing kernel here is that it relates um, the density of states at, at some uh, values of n and j um, to the density of states or the Fourier coefficient at different energies. In particular, we will see that it relates the uh, light states degeneracies to the uh, black hole uh, state degeneracy. Um, so the crossing kernel is given uh, by this formula. And uh, the most important part here is the Bessel function that shows up. And here in the argument, uh, maybe you again almost already uh, recognize uh, the quantity that uh, gives you the area of term in, in gravity. Um, and we will see that a lot later. So out of curiosity, do you know why it's called a cross? Do you know why it's called a crossing kernel? Um, yeah, so the, well, I don't know if this is the origin, but this is how, how I learned about crossing kernels is that usually in a CFT, crossing kernels are used to relate data of one channel to another channel, so from S to T or from S to U. Um, and you use crossing symmetry to relate those things. Um, but I don't, yeah. I don't know if that is the- so It's somehow related to that? Yes. Yes, no, very much. And here, maybe it shouldn't be called a crossing kernel, but maybe like a spectral kernel or something, because it relates states of different energies and different charges to, to one another. Um, all right, and one thing to notice about the crossing kernels is that it's uh, almost entirely dependent only on the discriminants. 
Um, and there's this uh, very mild uh, dependence of a phase on the on the charges. And so just to make that more obvious, we will uh, use this notation of a kernel that only depends on the discriminants. And we will also encode um, the dependence on the discriminant of the Fourier coefficients uh, in this way. If I had a theory that wasn't n equals two supersymmetric, but just had some u one charge, would I would it be the same cross and kernel? Would it be some something different? Or because this was tied to the fact that the index was given by this new Jacobi form, yes. right? So, but maybe in a more general set of this would be a somewhat different function. But still, I think so. Yeah, I think uh, um, there's a paper by Nathan Benjamin and collaborators that. Add the kernel for uh, theories that have a U1 charge. Yeah. Um, I don't remember exactly the form. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can. I think the the maybe the one take home message is that the more symmetry you have, the more powerful these these kernels are. The more. Uh, how do you say that? The more. Uh, strict things you can say. Uh, uh, yes. All right, very good. So we have the crossing kernel. Now we're gonna look at the asymptotic behavior. So the behavior as uh, delta becomes very large. And to do that, we have to use the uh, asymptotic behavior of the Bessel function, which scales uh, with an exponential basically at large x. And so for large uh, discriminants, the behavior of the kernel is qualitatively different uh, depending on the sign of delta prime that showed up that we are uh, summing over. And so for negative uh, delta prime, the crossing kernel is smooth and it grows like uh, the exponential of uh, absolute value of delta prime. Um, and the way to see that is that the the variable that shows up inside the Bessel function went with square root uh, of delta prime. So on delta prime, uh, sorry, it went with the square root of minus delta prime. So when delta prime is negative, that's the thing inside the square root is positive, then you just have the normal exponential. However, when uh, delta prime is positive, uh, you get e to the some imaginary number. Uh, and the crossing kernel oscillates rapidly with the frequency uh, related to this uh, delta zero, delta prime. Sorry, so, so delta is the weight in the safety and that's mapped onto the energy in the Roughly, ball. yes. And is the idea that you're, uh, uh, so this idea that you want high energy is because you're looking at like mass safety. Black. I, I never quite we're looking. That, right? We're looking at mass uh, black holes, and black holes show up in the spectrum yeah. at uh, positive discriminants. Yeah. So again, we see a, a relation between positive or a distinction between positive and negative. Yeah, I guess I, guess I, I never quite understood the 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 sure. why we looked at high energy states in particular. Um, because uh, so the only the only intuition I have is with the BTZ black hole, and mm -hmm. my understanding that that's a ground state. Yes, yeah, so the BTZ black hole, it has a uh, discriminant equal to zero. So it's right at the edge. It's, yeah. the, it's the sort of the black hole with the lowest energy yeah. possible. Um, she shifted by some constant. Or, yes, right. sorry. So the ground state, it will have uh, in my conventions, uh, scaling dimensions minus C over 24. Then at uh, Delta equals to zero, the black hole uh, part of the spectrum starts. Okay. Yeah. And you just take high energy? Or... Well, I'm I'm trying to understand the corrections to the area law. So okay. to go to that regime, you need to be at scaling dimensions where black holes exist. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's. Oh, um, you're saying that the the B the BTV shifted to be at zero. Yes. Oh, yes. I see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she had the C oh, minus C okay. right. twenty four. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's, yeah. I see. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe I should emphasize. Should have emphasized that more. Um. So we have this distribution over density of states. 
um, that we using the crossing curl can write as an integral over um, delta prime of these Fourier coefficients or as a sum over uh, delta prime of these Fourier coefficients times the crossing kernel. Um, and for large discriminants, uh, we can split uh, the contributions to a row in two parts. First, the contribution from these uh, negative discriminant states, which is the, um, the smooth uh, part. And then there's this other highly oscillating contribution, contributions coming from the states with delta prime uh, positive, uh, which uh, is highly oscillatory. And this, uh, this uh, contribution, it's, it's only there, it's, its role in life is to encode um, that this row here is just a sum over, over uh, 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 distinct Fourier coefficients. Uh, and it's not, it's not a continuous function, but it just hits at, at the integers. Um, so what we will do is we'll just uh, keep the smooth, uh, smooth part because that is the, the thing that dominates and is the most important. And sorry, you may have already answered this, but you have an integer charge spectrum here. Yes. If what if I have fractional charges? Yeah, you charges. can uh, you can rescale all the charges to make them integer to uh, get to these nice weak Jacobi forms. Uh, so you just like rename your charge. Yeah, but then the supercharge should change. Yes. The charge, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Okay. No, yeah, but it's easy easy to keep track of. Uh, those things. Um, and so to understand whether uh, our approximation, this row heavy light is good, we can compare it to the exact uh, coefficients, uh, C and L. And there's this exact, but very intricate and complicated uh, formula for the exact Fourier coefficients, um, which existed long before uh, we started thinking about these things. Uh, and so all the answer or all the things that I'm saying are hidden also in those exact uh, formulas. Um, but they are quite hard to uh, to extract from these formulas. And so it's, it's really um, a lot easier to work with these crossing kernels. And it also uh, gives us a lot of intuition uh, at what these things are encoding. Um, but since we are doing an approximation, we should uh, understand uh, how good that approximation is. Um, and for the states uh, that we are interested in, for the states that encode the black holes, um, we see that the exact coefficients divided by our approximation uh, is equal to one plus uh, exponentially suppressed terms. So the approximation is good, and we can use uh, this row heavy light uh, to study uh, the heavy spectrum. What is the heavy spectrum? What what these are the, the black holes? Okay. Uh, and things that maybe have the same yeah. mass as a black hole but are not a black hole. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. yeah, these are the microstates that make up the area law, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever they are. Um, so we can use crossing kernels to study the heavy spectrum. And uh, the equation that is important is uh, this equation for a uh, rho heavy light. And it's given again by a sum over negative discriminant states uh, with discriminant delta prime. Oh, sorry, I, I probably should have asked this earlier. So it is a crossing kernel you mentioned that it's related to the, like, the SMT. Is it like map, how you map heavy to light states exactly. under the symmetry? Yes, it is It is encoding how to do an S transformation. <laughs> okay, so it's, like, it's, it's just that what they want to one map from heavy to light states uh, that the crossing, yeah. or the crossing kernel yeah. is defining that mapping. Um, from, from the, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's defining that mapping, but it is it is showcasing how that how that symmetry encodes uh, information about the heavy spectrum in the light spectrum and vice versa. Okay. 
not that the states are swapped, it's that the, the boundary conditions are not The boundary conditions are swapped. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we can uh, come back to that. Okay. Change the time and space circle. Oh, okay. Because I use change S to T. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is the equation that we're going to study. And for uh, large values of the discriminant, um, we can compare the crossing kernel with some uh, at some value delta prime to the crossing kernel uh, at the ground state uh, delta zero, and you find this uh, this expression. It's uh, pretty uh, easy to see. Uh, but what we learned from this expression is that at uh, discriminants a lot larger than the absolute value of the ground state degeneracy. So these are really heavy uh, black holes. Um, the Fourier coefficients are dominated uh, by only the ground state contribution in this in this sum. And so they are given uh, by this expression, which is just uh, the first uh, gross and curl written, written out. And um, that scales imprecisely uh, this way, which uh, is related to uh, the area over 40. And this is, this is the universal Cardi behavior uh, uh, written out in terms of this language of crossing curls. Um, but now that we have gone through all this technology uh, and have this uh, very systematic way of understanding different contributions, uh, we can ask what is what are the corrections to the uh, universal area law as we start probing lighter and lighter uh, black holes. So let's uh, do that. And from our expression on the previous page, it is clear that those corrections are purely controlled by the light spectrum because uh, the sum was only over these uh, delta primes that were less than zero. So the corrections to the area law are fully encoded by the perturbative spectrum uh, of like uh, the vacuum ADS3 uh, solution. And to make that uh, connection more clear, we will write rho heavy light not as a sum anymore, but as an integral over some distribution again. Um, where this row light is just um, a sum over delta functions of the uh, Fourier coefficients. And when we do that, we can um, study uh, this integral using uh, saddle point approximations. And in this language- uh, It's only over the polar parts? Or... Yes. Yes, so the polar oh. part, it goes from uh, minus delta zero all the way up to zero. So these are precisely the negative uh, Delta primes. And um, let me remind you of the two different types of growth uh, that we uh, defined all the way at the beginning. We had this fast growth that is um, consistent with having a string theory spectrum or a stringy spectrum uh, with non localities. And we have this slow growth uh, behavior um, that is consistent with having a QFT. Um, on some uh, compact manifold. Um, and again, let me point you to the parameters alpha, omega, and theta that will uh, be the ones that encode the corrections uh, to the area law, as we will see. Sorry. Um, maybe I should have a question earlier. Like, are the uh, light operators here uh, at order C or at order one? Uh, they're at order one. Other one, order or they're they're the ground state plus order one. Okay, sure, thanks. Um, but this is this is the this is their growth behavior as we uh, approach uh, the order C, basically. All right, very good. Um. So we know that uh, the area terms, it, it shows up as the discriminant uh, is parametrically larger 
than uh, delta zero, the central charge or the ground state uh, energy. But we see that as we approach um, uh, delta zero or the absolute value of delta zero, corrections to the Cardi growth are universal. And the way to see that, or the way that uh, we found that out is to uh, look at this, uh, look at this integral to the saddle point and you see that the saddle point is totally all the way at the bottom, uh, bottom of this integral. So it's it's given by delta prime equals delta zero. You, you treat it as a real integral. There's no complex saddle point or anything like that. Uh, we treat it as a real integral. Um, and so um, in that. So when you say it's universal, so it's universal in the ADS CFT picture. Uh, I mean, it's universal. The the way that I mean the word universal is that it doesn't depend on any of these parameters that I defined here. So um, in that regime of uh, of discriminants and energies, uh, the corrections to the area term they don't care whether you have fast growth or slow growth, whether well, whether the spectrum is stringy or not. Uh, so it's not that it's theory independent. Um, it's, it's, it only depends that you have no bigger growth than this, but as soon as you have, uh, this growth or slower, the corrections do not really care about this or are not sensitive, uh, about the precise form of the, uh, of the light spectrum. And so you see that the corrections, um, to the, to the area. Uh, term are purely given or determined by the uh, C of the ground state, so the ground state degeneracy. And any corrections are exponentially suppressed. Very good. Um, but then we can do even a little bit better. So for scalings uh, that go like this, where A is some uh, number between zero and one. So this is uh, these are lower energies than the uh, uh, regime uh, I discussed above. We can only recover the, the leading order area term uh, for slow growing weak Jacobi forms. So here it is really important um, that you have really a local uh, theory if you want to access uh, uh, black holes in these, uh, this regime. Uh, and here the dynamics are a little bit more interesting. Uh, you do a cell point approximation in the integral on the previous slide. And what you find is that there is um, this, uh, well, there's again the area term, but there is uh, there are these logarithmic corrections uh, that depend in a somewhat intricate way on the, on the parameter values that, uh, that determine the, the slow growth behavior of the of the uh, light states. There are also some some small corrections to the area term, and they are exponentially suppressed uh, uh, corrections to this. And this uh, scaling behavior uh, now it's not only or it's not valid uh, for discriminants that are larger uh, than delta zero. But it's uh, it's valid in this uh, regime that is uh, again determined uh, by the parameter alpha that showed up uh, in the definition uh, for a slow growing uh, weak Jacobi form. Is the prefactor something here I could give a gravity argument for? Like this is some one loop determinants and it, it it should be, but I will uh, okay. I will comment. Very soon. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but, no, never mind. <laughs> Great. So, yes. So, this is a result that you get purely from studying these weak Jacobi forms. You don't really have to think about black holes at all. Um, but, of course, uh, I and I guess you too are, are mostly interested in, in the physics applications of, of these results. So, let me discuss those. Um, first, uh, for ADS3 CFT2, 
so these results they um they show how the uh, fact whether you had a holographic CFT or not, how that imprints on the heavy states. So say you had uh, control over the heavy states, then you can learn about whether this theory is, is uh, holographic or not. Um, and in ADS3 CFT2, our results can be reproduced for uh, weak Jacobi firms coming from symmetric product orbifold CFTs. Um, where you can do the inverse Laplace transform that relates the uh, density of states to the uh, to the weak Jacobi form, uh, you can do that complete computation explicitly. Um, and then you can also apply our technology to logarithmic corrections to supersymmetric black holes in higher dimensions, where on the gravity side, most of uh, the work has been pioneered by Ashok Sen. And then for these higher uh, dimensional black holes, you have to go to a, a scaling regime uh, where the ADS3 or ADS2 uh, near horizon geometry um, is present. And that appropriate scaling regime is uh, determined by the uh, dimensional reduction that you do when you go from these ADS5 or five dimensional or four dimensional uh, black holes back to uh, AES2 or AES3. And so what we find is that uh, for four dimensional black holes with n equals four or eight supergravity, um, the appropriate scaling regime is the universal one. Um, and so the computation to do uh, in, the, in the CFT side, in the microscopic side is in some sense uh, trivial. You just count the number of ground states and then you know uh, all the corrections uh, to the to the area term in that setup, and well, curiously or maybe not curiously, the computation in in the supergravity side is very hard. Uh, you have to do a one loop determinant in four dimensions, um, which is quite intricate. Then another setting where our results uh, can be used or our techniques can be used are in the so-called 5D BMPV black holes, um, where instead we are in this non-universal scaling regime. So the regime where the parameters of the, of the uh, perturbative growth are important. And so here on the CFT side, the computation is, uh, is more intricate and you have to learn uh, and figure out uh, some details of, of the theory. But instead, the gravity uh, here, the gravity computation is trivial because the uh, one loop determinants are very simple or trivial. And then another setting where uh, our results uh, or our techniques can be used are in 5D uh, n equals 2 supergravity, um, where there are black holes. But here I should put an asterisk because um, I think it's uh, from reading the literature, it's not very clear what the perturbative spectrum uh, is in this setup. Um, so it's not so clear what you should uh, input in, in our formulas. Um, but the scaling regime, again, is uh, non-universal. And uh, yeah, there's uh, there's things to things to learn there for sure. Do any of these, do these techniques in any of the cases lead to a calculation of the number of states? Um, yes. mean, can, yeah. Yeah, you can you can match to the results that Ashok Sen found. So he found some formula in terms of, for example, the number of vector multiplets, number of hypermultiplets. Um, when we go to the uh, go to the CFD description of those systems, we precisely reproduce uh, these results, at least in the in the first two cases, mm -hmm. um, but then in the final case, things are uh, things are very subtle. Um, but yeah, so this is yeah, this is what I or maybe I should reiterate the point that I was trying to make. So in forty, this computation by Ashok Sen, where he gets the like number of vectors minus number of hypers plus two or something like that. Um, it takes a lot of effort to to get there. Well, from the CFT side, the computation is almost trivial. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
But you also know the CFT, right? Mm -hmm. Or I mean, you have like, you have to know the the perturbative scaling yeah. of the CFT. Um, yes. Um. And so we we see this uh, this instance of the weak strong duality very clearly uh, coming up. Um, and our results give uh, a microscopic interpretation to the logarithmic corrections where this, these weird formulas that showed up after long computations. Um, we uh, we give the interpretation that these are these are just the ground states. I think that is that is quite nice, quite a nice result. Um, so yeah, thanks. That's what I wanted to say. Are there more questions for the time? Just to clarify, then, the most general setting has not been matched to a bold calculation yet. So, um, like with higher Susie, yes. Well, I, then, I want to. The maybe the, the statement, I, I think the gravity side things are not quite clear yet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not so in a sense you're making predictions, right? Is that maybe, yeah, maybe, but it, it seems like so there's this uh computation again in that case by Ashok Sen. Um and he's using some formulas in a scaling regime where they are not supposed to hold, or it's not right. known if they hold or not. And it seems from our point of view that indeed they don't quite hold. Mm -hmm. Like um in the regime where he uses um, the formulas, we find that there are also large corrections to the area, just the leading order area. Mm -hmm. So things uh, things are very subtle and, and people don't really seem to agree on, uh, on the situation, even on the gravity side. So it's... Are they supposed to be small flag holes? Like when you say large corrections to the area? I don't know. So what I, what I mean for large corrections to the area is that uh, this term gets an order one factor uh, next to it. So we don't have area over 4G, but some number of times area over 4G. Um, so things, things to understand. Um, but I, yeah, our, our, if you give us a, a perturbative spectrum, if you give us the values for theta, alpha, and omega, then we will give you some logarithmic corrections. And then Maybe that's somehow a test whether whether that perturbative spectrum is the right perturbative spectrum or maybe a confirmation if, if things match or not. But, uh, it seems that already on the gravity side, these are quite unclear. There was another question. Did you oh, I, I, was just, I, I was just trying to understand. Still trying to understand universal. So you, you say those depend on the on the light spectrum. So it's like you're introducing smaller and smaller black holes. And what do you say does it depend? You mean like the density of states for smaller and smaller black holes or uh, uh, I mean I mean that um the corrections to the area term for these scaling regimes. So the corrections for to the area term for smaller and smaller black holes. Um, these corrections do not care about the behavior at very low energies. Um, they don't care about the value of theta. They don't care about the value of alpha. They don't care about the value of omega. The corrections in this regime of smaller and smaller black holes up to this uh, this threshold are are universal in that sense. So they're kind of like a consistency check, like if someone wrote down. And I'm not sure if this is what you're saying, or like if someone gave you a per perturbative uh, spectrum, then mm -hmm. you can use this as a consistency channel. Um. Yeah, I I don't I don't know if I would want to say it that strongly. Like if, um, yeah, you would you would have to study a little bit. I think the the, the details. Okay. Um, but that's one way that. Uh, you might try to use these techniques. 
Yeah, if I may, uh, what happened to the first appro approximation that you showed with delta much, much larger than delta zero? This doesn't find an application at all. Um, no, it's it's it's, it's this encoded result. already here. Yeah, it's encoded in in this uh, in this. So it's the same actually, it's going from delta much much larger to delta zero yes. to delta roughly delta yes. zero, same. Ah. Yes, this is just the universal Cardi uh, mm. or area. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay, before we thanks to Helena again, we'll be taking her to dinner. If you would like to join, let me know. Um, yeah, thanks a lot.